it said. Um, I usually talk about all my affiliations, but I give up on that. The only thing you need to know is that I have drone in my Twitter handle, and that makes me an expert. That's all you got to do. <laughs> so I just want to talk about <clears throat> 23 years of airspace integration. And uh, this all started out, I don't know if you guys, um, or ev everyone had seen this, but uh, we produced this uh, timeline to kind of give people a sense of how long this airspace integration thing has taken. And it started, this was a, a meeting here that the FAA had in July 30, 1992, that, hey, maybe it's time to take another look at AC-9157. You know, things had changed. And so then it kind of progressed, things kind of, you know, 10 years, things kind of died down a little bit, and then it kicked off. And we're right here. It's a long time. It's a good graph, too, because it talks about, you know, who was the administrator and it's good stuff in there. So for me, these are some of the high points in history. And um, up here is the world famous Cracker Barrel, which was actually the aircraft that I was using when I started back in like 2003, 2004, doing this commercially. It's a, uh, called a slow stick. GWS made it. It's $29. Uh, put a camera on there, go out and make money. I'm like, Psh, this is a no brainer. This is easy money. So that's how I started. Then the next picture is a bunch of uh, folks from the R Kappa. And that, was, that wasn't our first, let's say, um, we had already been talking to the FAA, knew that rules were coming, and they suggested, hey, you know, uh, go over there and uh, join up. The AST ASTM is firing up the F-38 committee, did lots of good work with uh, F-37. You should get over there. And so these are, you know, there's me, look, fresh-faced kid with hair, long time ago. And there's Gene Robinson. And I think at the time he was doing that Alamo movie, so he had to grow the sideburns for the movie. Anyway, so we got started there. We, we uh, you know, started with the ASTM. I remember getting the paperwork at that uh, meeting in 2005. And the timeline on it was out to 2009. And I was like, oh, man, that's where the, uh, the belly aching started. So I've been pretty much a professional uh, belly aker since about 2005. And um, then we came over here in... Uh, this is January or February 13th of 2007, where commercial cracker barreling was no longer legal. And we were like, oh, man, this is this isn't cool. And this is kind of when I stopped uh, flying for profit, because I figure, you know, if you're going to interface with the regulator, you can't be breaking the law. I didn't really agree with it. But, you know, what are you going to do? You can't fight City Hall or so they say. This right here is the. Um, this is when we came out of the small UAS arc, and they published uh, the recommendations on April 1st of 2009. I was not really happy with what was in those recommendations, and I spent, on that arc, I spent about 10 months just, uh, let me just say the last meeting, I said, I'm, even, I'm tired of hearing my own voice, and I'm going to go sit down, because this is just, we're, we're getting, we're not getting something good. Very limiting very limiting uh, visual line of sight envelope. It, it, it really wasn't good. I didn't really see how we were gonna build an industry out of this. Um, and we also put together a exemption for micro UAS and it's been floating around out there. But anyway, that's kind of the timeline. So prior to February 15th of this year, this is kind of how I felt right here. I really was looking at the Europeans and going, wow, you know, they're doing uh, pretty well. They have kind of a pragmatic approach. You can approach the CAA people. We can do things. We have a little bit of a different system here. Um, you know, there's, there's different factors involved, but I was really hoping that we would get something more progressive. Then February 15th, and the NPRM gets uh, put out in the register. And as far as I'm concerned, we as a community here in the United States got a gift. It wasn't, it wasn't so limiting. The, the visual line of sight envelope wasn't um, really defined. I was afraid it was gonna be 1,500 feet for visual line of sight. 
It's actually more of an interpretation thing. We were kind of concerned that there would be commercial licenses for this, which would just be a killer. Where we don't have that, we have a. Um, well, as I had uh, emailed Jim after they put that out, I thought we had something that was very progressive. And I think people who have been a part of the airspace integration effort for uh, a few years see the NPRM as a gift. Some of the people that are newer to it say, oh, it's still too restrictive and I want to fly beyond visual line of sight. I'm on the beyond visual line of sight uh, action team, the FAA helped uh, or put together and, uh, you know, I think we have a, a lot of barriers before we're ready to fly beyond visual line of sight. And one of them is going to be, you know, but we can't just take the big IT names word for it that their stuff works. You're going to have to have some sort of I, I, I just I haven't been able to find one aviation person in the world who thinks that we'll be able to do beyond visual line of sight uh, flying without some sort of software certification. And I, I kind of believe that uh, we're going to have to do something like that. So the future ought to be uh, interesting, but at least if we can get off the ground in the visual line of sight uh, envelope, I think that'll be great. So this is where I'm at. With, uh, you know, we've been talking for years that we need data. Oh, the FAA needs data, and um, they do need data. But I think we, after being at this for so many years, we can figure out what that data is that they need. And I wish we uh, had done a little bit more science. If we had more leadership in this, um, let's say, sector, I think we would have probably commissioned some baseline studies. And I, I think for beyond visual line of sight, you're going to have to, we're going to have to figure out and do the science. What is the visual acuity of the human eyeball to see and avoid other aircraft? And then we'll have a baseline. Then when we come up with a software and hardware solution for this, we will have something to measure it against. Until we have that, all we have really are feelings. And I've been uh, saying that about the NPRM. Everybody, oh, you know, this is what you got to say uh, when you reply to the NPRM. And, you know, you're either writing love letters or hate mail to the FAA unless you have data. If you don't have data, you get, you've got conjecture. And, you know, I replied back, me and Gene, for our cap, and it was basically a few paragraphs because uh, we don't have that data. So to say, oh, I want to fly beyond visual line of sight. Oh, okay, great. Hey, how about another one here? The kinetic energy study for drones. You know, what, you know, everybody talks about safety of the NAS. Well, we don't even know for sure what the risk these UAS uh, pose to the NAS or to the people on the ground because we haven't done the study. We haven't done the science. And I don't think as a community, um, even as, as just a society, we're going to tolerate, and I don't want to put throw any particular company under the 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 bus or Airbus or whatever you want to call it, but people are not going to tolerate delivery drones whacking them in the head, falling on their cars, you know, hitting their animals. People, people they're not going to tolerate that. So you're going to have to, um, you know, get with the program, and we're going to have to figure out what this risk is. I think we need to do these scientific studies. This should be a public-private partnership, uh, maybe with some universities. Somebody's going to have to put up some money. But there are companies in this community that are making the money that can write checks for this. And we need to invest in our own futures. Then I think what we need to do is, you know, have it peer reviewed. We need some QA, QC on the data so it's not just that stuff pulled out of the sky. And then we can come in and maybe plug that into what uh, Parmel's doing over at NASA with the UTM and actually have a, uh, let's say, a cornerstone or a starting point where we can actually seriously go to the regulator and go, hey, you know what, we did this science, here it is. Uh, we had NASA look at it, and they, they reviewed it, looks good. And then if the when, I shouldn't say if, I say when the mishap does happen, and the mishap is going to happen, um, at least in the FAA and the NTSB and DOT can come back and say, well, you know, we did all the science here and the law of averages got, uh, got away from us. So we're going to change our procedures and we're going to move forward um, and we're going to try better next time. We're going to be safer next time. That's how it works. And that's what I think we need to do if we want to be taken credibly or taken seriously as a community that wants to do this as business. This is kind of how I see it. It's not the way I wanted to see it. 
you know, but uh, we had the reauthorization bill and, you know, they're not UAVs, they're, they're aircraft. Um, that's kind of what they're written into the law, so that's how they're defined. And then you had the ruling at the NTSB that they're aircraft, so, you know, you're in the aviation business. And you're going to have to get with the program. You know, it's going to depend on what the regs look like. I mean, I, I'm surprised that uh, I'm waiting to... I'm sure there's some internal pushback from some of the manned groups about the NPR. Maybe a little. I'm just thinking, might be. But uh, we'll have to see what that comes out with. But you're going to, you know, you're going to have to do stuff like, uh, you know... <laughs> you're going to have to run it by the legal team. I hear a lot of guys that, uh, you know, they're like, oh, you know, we'll just fly this around and we'll have one guy running thousands of these. And if they crash into each other and fall out of the sky, that's okay. That doesn't sound like anybody ran it by legal to me because uh, the next guy in line, your liability insurance guy, I don't think, he, you know, after the first, well, again, I don't want to mention any company names, but after one of these delivery drones hit somebody, uh, the liability lawsuit's going to probably be, you know, 10 million, 20 million. We have any lawyers in the room that want to take a guess what that's, that first liability lawsuit's going to be? So you might want to talk to your insurance guy. And if they both sign off on your plan, I think you've you got a good chance of uh, being good to go. And those are just some food for thought for people in the community as we move forward. I think we have to act responsibly as a community if we want to be a business community. And, uh, you know, keep, keep records, uh, have insurance, you know, do all the real stuff that real business people do. And then uh, for me, I'm kind of, I, I kind of see these are converging technologies, the land, air, sea, and space. Um, all of these technologies kind of share some of the same stuff, and uh, that's all I'm into. And I think that uh, Silicon Valley, I said a few years ago, people were talking, oh, San Diego's the Silicon Valley of drones, or Portland's the Silicon Valley of drones. There's only one Silicon Valley of drones, and it's right here in Silicon Valley. And all these technologies, the people that come here, it's like the Hollywood of technology, and people come from all around the world, and I meet people that are working on these different technologies. And I really think we need to get out of the silos, join together and uh, work together. And really that's all I've got. You know, there's no real complaining or whining this year. I know you guys are probably surprised. Oh yeah, Jim's, oh yeah. <laughs> now, does anyone have any questions for me? Yes, sir. Do you still fly drones? Um, I do fly drones. I usually, um, I'm either, let's say, I only fly in restricted or warning airspace with the military, or um, I, I uh, fly in my backyard, which is closer than five miles to the airport, but I do call the tower. And every time I call the tower, the dude in the tower is like, well, okay. What are the rules? Because I fly RC. What's, what's the deal? And I'm like, well, probably want to get on the FAA page and look. Talk to you later. You know. But, um, you know, they let me fly. I'm, I'm 3.3 miles from the airport, so the new stuff kind of uh, cramps my style. But uh, I, do, uh, I do fly for fun, you know. That's about it. No break in the law for this kid. Go ahead, John. Hey, Patrick, thanks for, thanks for putting this on. Thank you. I want to ask you, have you had any um, conversations with the insurance industry underwriters? Are they positioning? Are they trying to figure out what kind of a business model of it is available? What kind of actuarials they're going to use? What are they thinking? You know, you've got the legal side, but then you've got the underwriting side. Well, you know, um, it's interesting you say that because we do have a guy, uh, Terry Miller from Transport Risk, and he's going to speak, and he is an insurance I guess he's a broker. He already does manned aviation, and he's been doing that for year, years. And now he's underwriting unmanned. And I'm sure that his presentation is going to be uh, very interesting. I do have telephone conversations with him, and we talk off the record, and uh, I laugh pretty hard. The second part of that, um, if you look back in the formation of other industries, in the early stages, for example, if you look at the automotive industry, uh, you look at medical technologies, you look at manned aviation, 
that in some ways can help inform us about where we're at and where we're going, may or may not. Are they, you know, are there any perils that can be drawn with trying to figure out how to insure the first set of automobiles? Well, I, you know, I, I'm going to defer to Terry on that because I think he's going to be a let's say, able to answer those questions better than I am. But I do. I don't think that we're reinventing the wheel, you know. And really, and I've said that for a while, the, the cornerstones of, of any, like, new industry are insurance and finance. If you can't get financing, you can't get in business. And if you don't can't get insurance, no one's going to finance you. It was like, you know, when I tried to buy the uh, Puma system at Farnborough last year. I asked them if they had financing or they, do they take bad checks? You know, they didn't have financing and they didn't want to sell me one. Yes, sir. The uh, sort of what seems to me is the parallel or orthogonal efforts right now with the NPRM and the sort of one off 333 exemptions that are going on. Um, speak for a moment, if you would, about your own personal view of are those going to converge? What's the timeline look like? Are we looking at another year of, you know, you should go off and get a 333 or? Is the NPRM going to come to a head within that time? A little bit of, of your prognosis. Well, <clears throat> you know, besides the FAA being mean, he goes, no. I think the 333 is kind of, it's, it's, it could, it's, a, it's, it's something. I don't, you know, we, uh, I see the news reports coming out and they'll be like, five more people got approved or 20 people, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, we're talking onesie, twosie, tensie, and I'm talking hundreds. So it, it is a path, but... It's not really, let's say, I would call a viable path. The other thing I don't like, and, you know, it's another thing about being a community show. I don't like, some people are paying up to $50,000 to have a lawyer file their 333 exemption. And uh, you're, way, you're shaking your head no, but I've heard that. And that, we've got polite company in the room, so I'm not going to curse. But uh, it's BS. Um, I think people are coming into this industry and they're, they're carpet bagging and fleecing and I wouldn't pay that. I've heard people, some people pay $2,000. Maybe now that's reasonable, but anything uh, over that, and I'm sure I'll have some people hating me, but I don't really care because that's what I do. Um, that's too much. And you shouldn't be fleecing a fledgling industry where there are really no income streams. Uh, that's the same thing with this show. You'll notice that shows are popping up every week. There's new show, two shows a week, you know, and, um, and people ask me to come and speak or whatever. And I'm like, well, what experience do you have with unmanned aircraft systems? They say, well, we don't have any, we got home audio. We got, you know, go home and garden, whatever. People are just trying to ride in here and make money off of an industry that doesn't really, again, have a lot of income, legal income streams. So I think we got to take that into consideration when, you look at this community, you know, do the research before you go out and spend the money or, you know, hire somebody, some consultant who just got into this or whatever and get taken for a ride. You need to do your research. You need to talk to other people in the community and you need to get educated so you don't get taken for a ride. Now, the NPRM and the, uh, the rules and all the rest of that, you know, <clears throat> I'm going to let Jim be the bad guy on that one. But uh, I think it's, I mean, I think it's so liberal myself, the, the 55 pounds and all the rest of that. I'm, I, I, I can't believe that the, the man guys aren't going to push back on that because really I, the way I see it, I kind of see any, let's say, work that can be done in a manned aircraft that can now be done in an in a unmanned aircraft, the manned aircraft is not viable anymore. So I'm going to see, I, I think we're going to see some pushback. And then I think, um, you know, I don't know, you know, maybe this comment period, they're going to take them internally for a year. You know, I'm not on the current arc to help the FAA, you know, go through those comments. The people that are on the arc, in my estimation, are not qualified. Most of them are military or DOD vendors. DOD vendors are not, and I, you know, they're just, they're, they're not commercial people. $450,000 small UAS systems are not going to be supported in this business model. They're the wrong people to be going through the comments. They're the wrong people to be speaking for us. But, uh, you know, I've only been trying to get on the new arc since 2011. I know you, we've talked about it, you said, but I don't, you know, I, you need a watchdog. You need someone to bellyache. Who bellyaches now, Jim, on the arc? Do you have one? Plenty of bellyachers? Okay. 
I hope, sometimes I hear, you know, in some of these meetings people go, well, what would Patrick Egan say if he was here? And it's kind of, you know, well, that's nice that people remember me, but uh, he'd probably be, oh, man, we're getting screwed again, you know, or whatever. But anyway, that's, those are my opinions. I don't think it's going to be 12 months. I mean, you know, 16 months, 18 months, could go for another round. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's like roulette. So all those people out there that go, oh, I don't need a 333 exemption. Forget it, man. These rules are going to be out tomorrow. You know, well, they may be dreaming. The other thing, and, I, you know, I'm probably going over my time, but there are another couple of interesting things. One, I talk to people, a lot of people in this industry. And the NPRM, there's a whole group of people. Oh, well, the, the FAA put the rule out. We're good to go. And I'm like, uh, yeah, no, it's not how it works. Or I got the other camp. Oh, yeah, well, that's what the rule's going to be. So I'm just going to fly to that. And there's not going to be any enforcement. And I could build my, what? You know, yeah, oh, yeah, it'll be great. Don't worry about it. And then there's the cautious crowd like me that are like, mm, yeah, this is so liberal. I think we're going to go for a double go round on the uh, comment period. But we'll see what happens. So, you know, you got to just decide for yourself. You want to you wanna be in this business? I would not. I, I don't tell anyone to break the law. So that's not my bag. Personally, my thing, I don't like to participate in businesses that are against federal law. It's like a little hang-up I've got. But you got to do whatever you got to do. John first, and then uh, go ahead, John. Patrick, I was, was going to comment uh, on small businesses and the entrepreneurs that are in their garages, right? Many of them here in Silicon Valley that are walking into the venture capitalists and presenting them with the wonderful next, you know, giant revolution. What advice and counsel would you give them? Because there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of pandering in the marketplace. It's encouraging them to stick their shingle out and go to work. What advice and counsel would you give them? How do you encourage that innovation to be fostered when we all know there's no business model on the other side to make the venture capitalists feel confident about investing in them? Unless they've got a five or ten year plan. Yeah, most most venture capitals are uh, they're, they're talking about the next couple of quarters. I, I mean, they're calling me and they're in the room. There's people in the room and they're calling me. Oh, well, what do you think? I'm like, we got to talk because before you invest, I see these guys on the financial channel. Well, you know, we want to get into software. These guys, venture capital people in Silicon Valley, love software. Well, the, and the irony is, is the large incumbents in the military industrial complex are are just. They're excited about the commercial opportunities so they can take their hardware and they can translate that into commercial opportunities as you've talked about. So it's okay for the big incumbents, the folks that are well funded, to sit back and take a wait and see attitude. What about the kid in the garage that doesn't have all the time in the world? Well, you know, I wish I had that picture because, you know, one of my, the garage tinkerer that I like to use in as, a, in as an example is Tad McGear. Because I have a picture of him with an arrow sand on the bench in his garage down here in Silicon Valley. It's great, you know, box of cheer on the wash machine. So, you know, he's the ultimate garage tinker. And, you know, he says, like, if the rules were like they were now, Scan Eagle would not exist. It is very hard to get funding. The people that are, that are funding these things now, I don't think, are doing their due diligence. I hear them on the financial channels. I listen to what they say, and I go, I know who that person talked to. And who they talked to didn't know what they were talking about. So you got to, it's the caveat emptor, uh, you know, with the financing, um, I'm, I'm going personally, I think I'm going to try and do a startup. I want to get on the venture capital wheel of suffering and get in the news and be a thought partner and do all that crazy crap and talk about unicorns. It's going to be great. I can't wait. Everybody's got to be waiting for that because it's, I'm going full blown unicorn. It's going to be good. Yes. Uh, yeah. Touching on uh, you know, how do we develop these businesses uh, at the time, how do we bring them out of the garage, and I think traditionally there's always been a code of ethics that we operate by as innovators and entrepreneurs that seems to be getting lost in all this excitement. Um, there's an ethical way to integrate innovative uh, products into our culture without violating people's rights. Um, and in particular without the hotbed of the garage that's totally open, you wouldn't have Microsoft or the remote for that matter. And so to the remote, yeah, um, but they, um, so I, I've, we've been trying to work on a, you know, a, a drone aquifer's bill of rights. You know, the, the enthusiast and the professional does have rights 
uh, that have been existing for decades in America, and, and, and oddly enough, there are laws that do govern us professionally that have just been forgotten about. And I think if we as a group start to look deeper into what we've already established for safety protocol, you know, integration, we won't feel as lost as a group trying to move forward with this bigger uh, push. Um, and an aside, I, I consulted with a Fortune 500 company. The minute that the article came out about the proposed uh, rules and regulations, before 9 a.m., they had 15 phone calls from innovators trying to sell them. And they were just trying to sell them on the idea, the product, what have you. When the procurement officer asked simple questions about what it was that they were selling, they really couldn't answer the details that would be required if you were going to buy a video camera or buy a tractor. How do you not know how much fuel it uses? So what starts to unravel is that there's a lot of ideas that are trying to be bought and sold to the person who's ignorant. And so what's happening now is that the consultant needs to rise up and protect the industry before the industry gets mowed over by the guys who are just going from client to client to client and just moving forward. Um, well, and, and I think that some, you know, that's why this, there's going to need to be some regulation. I've said that all along. I, I quickly. So Steve Jobs, I would, I would speculate that Steve Jobs couldn't really well articulate what he was doing with Wallace in the very beginning with the wood box. I'd say Gates probably wasn't exactly uh, pristine in his explanation of what he was doing. Go through all of the founders and what they're doing. And so I think it's easy for us to put the lens of a mature industry, a mature product, a mature science behind something when it's immature coming out of the garage. Is trying to regulate and have all of this predictability so finance gets it, have the regulators get it. So you're putting these burdens on those kids in the garage that Gates didn't have, Wise didn't have, Jobs didn't have. It's, it's hard to crush the creation. All right, well, the, the, now the discussion's getting, because here's the, 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 the capper on that one is the stuff that they were doing in their garage didn't fly. Okay, so that that's kind of a different thing. But, what, what would the right, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, they, were, that, they, they would have probably told them to go back to building bicycles. But that's you know that's a different story. We do need. I think the way forward is going to be equipage. Um, I think you know we're going to need some standards, and I think we're going to need some best practices. And in some areas, we're probably going to need radar before we can all work together in an already occupied NAS? These are all good questions. Um, I talk to people all the time. Oh, we're starting a drone program. Well, what's it consist of? Well, I got my Phantom last week, and I'm going, and again, these are Fortune 500 companies. You know, you're like, uh, you know, we need to talk before you do that.